Welcome everyone to MetaCell's next webinar on Patient HM, The Brain That Changed Everything. My name is Stephen Larson. I am the Chief Executive Officer of MetaCell, and I'm really excited to have today with us Dr. Jacopo Anese. Today we're going to keep the format of this webinar as a conversation between myself and Dr. Anese. So as you're joining us, please take advantage of the question asking functionality of the webinar. We'd love to have your questions as we go along. We'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. As those questions come in, we'll have an eye on them and I'll pull out questions as we go to answer during the course of this hour. Uh, it's a really exciting project. Uh, it's a really exciting bit of science and science history. Um, but before we go any further, I'd like to give Jacopo a chance to introduce himself. So, Jacopo. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, Jacopo works better than the Dr. Anese. So, yeah, my name is Jacopo, and um, I'm now the CEO and uh, PI, Principal Investigator for the Brain Observatory. Uh, is, we're now an independent nonprofit, research nonprofit. Uh, when I did the work on HM, I was at UC San Diego, still here in, uh, actually today is in foggy La Jolla. And uh, yes, you know, ask your questions. We're gonna converse with, uh, with Steven and uh, just feel free to go ask us what you need to know about the site, about technical aspects of the site, about you know, how the project developed uh, behind the scenes. There's no secrets here. Excellent. Steven. Thank you. So before we go a little further, we just do want to get a sense of the room uh, who's joining us here. So I'm going to put up a poll on your screen right now. It's just going to ask you to let us know, roughly speaking, if you're in academia, if you're in industry, or if in your, you're in some other sector. So I'm going ahead and putting that poll in right now. Um, folks are voting. Thank you. Thank you very much for the votes. Looks like we've got almost everybody, if you won't mind putting your votes in. Last few folks. All right, great. And it looks like the results I'm seeing are 56% of you are coming from academia, 25% of you are coming from industry, and 19% other. So very good, welcome everyone. Bye. So Jacopo, First question for you, tell us a little bit about the genesis of the project, what your first entree was into the idea of working with HM. And while you're doing that, I'm going to put up on the screen the story page uh, from the website. Okay. Uh, so, well, it's a, it's a very long story and it's, um, it's almost 10 years ago now, actually. In, um, as we reminded in the invitation in December will be the 10th ten, the year of the the anniversary of uh, Henry Mollison's death. Can't believe 10 years are passed, but um, so the way I got involved, it's actually much before his death. Um, I was working at UCLA at the time. I was uh, the anatomist in uh, Arthur Toga's lab at UCLA, the laboratory of neuroimaging. And there were talks about uh, what to do with the brain of HM. And um, so I got involved in those conversations as the anatomist in, in residence uh, in ways, you know, to preserve the brain and um, what, what would be the best way to, to gather data that would obviously uh, have to uh, illuminate 50 years of, um, of neuropsychological testing. Uh, then things sort of slowed down. Uh, HM was still alive, so there wasn't any urgency. And I then moved to, I was recruited at UC San Diego, where I set up a lab to really that was focused on human brain uh, analysis. So we were running a brain bank, we had equipment, all the equipment was, was created um, big to be able to slice an entire human brain. So I started getting very uh, interested in this idea of mapping an entire human brain. You know, what was normally at the time done in mice, I said, why can't we do it for a larger specimen? And then to make a very long story a little shorter, uh, in uh, when HM was 80, um, I, I wrote a grant for the National Science Foundation, which was really more like a, a manifesto 
uh, you know, I just threw it out there and the idea that we didn't want to repeat the mistakes that were made with Einstein's brain uh, that was famously or notoriously, one can say, chopped into little pieces and uh, and a lot of it has been lost, a lot of it has not been examined. So to this day, we have little vignettes and little glimpses of Einstein's brain, but we really don't know its uh, connectivity architecture. And, uh, and I had been meeting uh, Dr. Corkin regularly. She's a, she's a, she was a foodie, she loved good food. And so we would meet every year on occasion of SFN for a very fancy dinner. And uh, on occasions of these dinners, we would discuss what to do with the brain. And eventually the grant got funded actually at the NSF, even though HM was alive. So it was, the, it was a grant that was funded without a starting date, which was very unusual. Uh, but it, the grant was also meant to get ready because we had to be all on our marks uh, if he died. And I went to meet HM uh, in a very secret location in, uh, in, in Connecticut. They didn't blindfold me, but it was close. I was not allowed to, of course, disclose, and I did not uh, where he lived. Um, and then he died on December 2nd, 2008. Um, and that's where the project really started. Um, and we, you know, we, at that point, we just started accelerating all the tests to be able to, to prepare for the slicing that happened in 2009. Go ahead. Great. Well, yeah, before you go on to the slicing, I do just want to point out what I'm sharing here on the screen is coming from patienthm.org, uh, the site that uh, we developed in collaboration with Jacopo. And uh, on this site, uh, there are several different sections we'll be showing during the webinar today. This is the story page. This allows a more dynamic environment for the posting of log-like articles within the site that gets updated uh, as needed. And if you want to learn more about the history of HM and the process of collecting the data, you can uh, go into this part of the site and you can see the different articles that have been placed in here uh, with a lot of really nice visual graphics that uh, give you a lot more background behind the story uh, of how this site came to be and the ultimate pathology that uh, was found within HM's brain. Yeah, if I may say something, you know, because um, we believe in um, we believe in citizen science, um, you know, the this story page actually you showed a little bit, you showed a couple of uh, postings a uh, little below that were about the amygdala, that were about the pathology. So I thought that in addition to the formal publication, which is also you can download was open access. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, I can show yes, sir. there is actually some, uh, some like uh, a little, little more. There is actually mm -hmm. data that has not been published, but it's available, uh, and and it can help. For example, there is a subdivision of the amygdala, the the frontal lesions. These are images that uh, were not necessarily published in peer-reviewed journals, but are available for the for anyone who is interested in learning more. And uh, and then, as Stephen will explain, we have the the complete atlas of the brain that's open for exploration. So who knows who's going to make the new discovery about HM's brain? That's right. So Jacopo, you were uh, telling us about the story, um, how you first got involved, and then you mentioned the cutting uh, of the brain. And uh, I remember this myself uh, as quite a significant uh, event that was happening while I was in graduate school that got quite a lot of interest online. Um, I was wondering if you had a movie that you could show potentially to uh, let us know how that went and remind us what, what happened in that? Well, uh, yeah, you, you can, can switch I, me, you can yeah. switch to me as an organizer and I can, let's see if this, this movie is here on the desktop. Um, it gives yeah. a good sense of what, it, what was happening then. Mm hmm there we go. So oh. I made you the presenter now. Okay, so hopefully this um, this will show well. So this is actually after 53 hours of continuous brain slicing. So you can see from my face that I, that I had that I had had enough. Uh, it was four days and uh, it was broadcast. So the reason why we broadcast the the cutting is because 
well, actually, there were two reasons. One is because I was, you know, we were very worried about doing something, you know, uh, we didn't want to, you know, damage the brain or do something. So, you know, whatever, we prepared very well, but we wanted to be very open, very transparent about what was happening in the lab. So even if anything had, would have happened, at least, you know, it was not going to be uh, hidden or behind closed doors. And the other thing is because I thought every time I sat at my microtome cutting brains, I, also, I always thought it was a very beautiful uh, event. I loved watching the slices on the blade, you know, you pick up with a brush. I just thought it was also a, a very interesting visual and an experience to share in itself. So the, the motivation was to be open uh, and not try to hide mistakes. Uh, and, and the other motivation was to share something that I found was, uh, if you excuse my, the word that's not very scientific, a very beautiful to look at. And so, but this is the last slide. Uh, which not even was sure at, the, at that point if there was any tissue left. Um, and I was waiting. Right. So you're ready? For, this is the last, huh? Yeah, you see. And actually, I wanted to stage it so that all the lights would go off because we wanted to observe a minute of silence after the procedure, in, which we did in honor of uh, Henry Mollison. But you'll see here that actually the theatrical staging didn't work uh, because there was one little light that stayed on. But that's the last one. And you see the eyes. Uh, I don't know how well you see it on your screen, but uh, you know that's what not sleeping for two nights in a row will do to your. Uh... <laughs> and I was very cranky too by the time. I was really cranky. There you go. And we're going to post these videos um, on occasion in December. We're going to create some new posting on the site so that we can share that more of that nights of those nights there you go so here i wanted to switch the lights off and be completely dark and uh, nope and there was one little light that i forgot and <laughs> so i'm searching behind to you know not everything goes according to plans but at least the cutting did go according to plan so yes in uh, in december we're going to recreate those nights and rebroadcast uh, the entire slicing so people if they want if they don't have anything better to do, they can watch again 50 hours of uh, of cutting. Are you back? To, is it back to you now? Yes. The controls. Okay, good. I feel feel relieved. Yes. So um, I, I think it's it's great. I, I, a lot of people watch that live stream, right? Did you remember kind of how much uh, attention you guys got? Yeah. Well, the supercomputer center told us we had about 400,000 views but we don't know how long people stayed tuned in um, but we know that people at least uh, checked it out uh, but the twitter feed was the most interesting uh, mm -hmm. hashtag hm because the twitter feed we could really watch uh, people tweeting from everywhere in the world as the time zones would shift because we were just we didn't know what well, we knew what was night and day, but we kept going. And so you would we would get these tweets from Korea, and then you know the time zone would move Australia and back to Europe. And the tweets showed you know that people were were really taking this uh, in a very nice way. Very, it was almost humorous. People would say, "I need to go and pick up my kids, but I can't leave the monitor. I, I'm mesmerized by the brain being sliced." You know, and. Uh, People were, and, and, and it was 2009, so you can imagine too, the technology to broadcast wasn't as good as it is now. And so we had to, a lot of what we did actually was, had to be built in house because at the time there wasn't, there weren't so many services like there are now that we actually took advantage of with the new site, uh, as you know. At the time we had to build everything from scratch, so it was a little more, uh, I would say not clumsy, but it was definitely a little more awkward. Um, Great. So, um, so you just told us that you had met Henry uh, beforehand, and then uh, you were charged with doing the slicing of his brain. What's it like to slice the brain of somebody that you've met? Well, I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? <laughs> you might be next, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I sent him to Boston. He was worried that uh, <laughs> no, we do that because uh, 
because I mean HM was uh, one of the brains that um, one of the brains that we were working on for the, the the brain library, which at the time we called the digital brain library, and now it's called the human brain library. The idea of cataloging uh, different stories of patients and even healthy people, actually, I mean people who passed away for reasons other than neurological disease. Those are the controls. So it's a project that is running in San Diego locally. So uh, by virtue of the na by nature of the project, you know, we need to meet them because we need to record the stories. We need to uh, understand better how these patients are experiencing the disease. And then they wield their brains to the project. But And, you know, pretty much they wield their brain the, the same way they could wield a painting that they have in their house. Uh, so it is not really a brain bank that operates after the fact, chasing the list of deaths from a hospital. Uh, it's people that whom we know and they participate and it's well understood that they want their brain preserved, they want their brains to help uh, uh, research. And it's very interesting because, you know, HM, uh, Mr. Mollison, Alt Mollison also had stated in one of the interviews, I think it's available on NPR, in one of the interviews, he says, you know, what they find out about me uh, will help uh, others. And that's, I think, the main motivation for people to uh, leave their brains behind. Uh, and if, it makes sense also because, you know, the alternative is not very flattering. It's either being reduced to ashes or to rot. I hope there's not people who are having breakfast now. Uh, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think we, we offer the, an alternative that's more attractive, like being immortalized, so to speak, uh, on the web and have, like in our case, we get uh, on this website, the new website, we get three or four requests every day to access. And the request is only nominal, by the way, we should say there's no restrictions. But the request, we, are, we like to know why, why are you curious about HM? Are you using this for teaching? Are you using this for... Uh, for research, are you using this? To, and and there is, the, these motivations are very different. Some people are just curious about the brain, and they they want to look at a real brain. Uh, sometimes, Stephen, we forget that there's not much out there that's similar to this. If somebody wants to look at a, a hippocampus, uh, the way that the cellular, and you Google hippocampus, you know, cells, you get a lot of images from peer-reviewed papers uh, that end up there, but you don't really get a, a proper a proper ar archive and that's the goal of the brain library like whether you're in eighth grade or you're a professor in university you need some images of the hippocampus from different types of patients you should just grab them that's the idea but we're not there yet but the template that we built for hm is an excellent template for all the other brains that we're going to publish online you know, I do think you're talking me into donating my brain to you with the idea that that's sort of this digital legacy uh, and there's not that much data in there. So, you know, you might get me yet uh, to sign up uh, for it. Well, you're a bit younger than me, so I'll try to stay healthy. So, so uh, personally. Yeah. So as folks have been joining us, I just wanted to uh, remind you that we're doing this in a conversation format. We're going to be looking more at the site uh, that we put together with Dr. Anessa, with Jacopo here. Um, uh, but we very much would like your questions. So far, we haven't had anybody uh, chime in with questions. So please, as you're listening to us, don't hesitate to add some questions in there and we'll draw them out as we go through this process. But for right now, we've been walking through the genesis of the understanding of the data of the brain of HM. And we learned about uh, Jacopo's introduction uh, to Henry and uh, the cutting process. And then at some point, this data set needed to make its way to the web. And I believe that there was, was there some grant that was associated with that, Jacopo, that you put in for? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, the original grant covered a bit of the web applications too, but the, the two grants that st the, the projects were from the National Science Foundation and the Dana Foundation. The Dana Foundation is a private organization and, and, and we use that grant. We're not talking about a lot of money, but essentially it was what we needed. Um, and we used the grant from the Dana Foundation primarily to, to, be, to, to build some tools uh, and to build the first website, which was originally hosted at UCSD. 
Um, in fact, if you go to the, we preserved that, uh, that initial atlas, uh, and you can find it uh, on the tab in the navigation bar, if you go to histological atlas, that all those components in there are, um, are essentially the, compo the original components of the original atlas. Um, let me see. Yep, there there we go. Now I see it. Yep, so this is what you're talking about, the histological atlas. Yeah, so now you see the website. No, that's a good size, that's perfect. Yeah, so these were the initial components. So what we did at the time, we had, of course, uh, images that we acquired during the cutting, which you see on top. Those are block face images, so-called. And for each of those, we created anatomical delineations so that people could search for structures. So, Stephen, if you, for example, want to look at the, whatever was left, of the hippocampus, if you type yep. hippocampus, looks like yep. you've done already. It's there, perfect. So the idea was to bring out the all the slices that contain the hippocampus. At the time, uh, because again, the the tools to do this type of work, we wanted. Remember, the goal was to allow exploration, uh, not only in our lab but in many different labs, or even, uh, as I said, citizen science. Uh, you can actually try try to go to the hippocampus because if um, what we realize, I mean, this technology of being able to view an entire giant slice, they call them a whole, it's actually very good to kind of get an idea of where things are and then zoom in. At the time we used, we kind of hacked into, we didn't need to hack APIs of Google APIs. So at the time we used Google applications and instead, of course, of a map of the world, we had the map of the brain. And so here you see the, the dente gyrus in HM. And this was very surprising because theoretically HM, HM was not supposed to have a hippocampus because the story <laughs> was that uh, it was removed surgically. So one of the main findings, uh, and I think obviously, remember if we hadn't sliced the whole brain, if we hadn't done a 3D modeling of the whole brain, we would not, have uh, really discovered this, I think, to the extent that we did. Uh, it was very interesting to realize after more than 50 years that what Scoville said, Scoville was the surgeon who uh, operated on HM back in uh, 1953, when HM was 27. Uh, he actually did not accomplish what he was set out to do uh, because he, he left, I would say, almost half of the hippocampus in HM's brain. And uh, in fact, this is explained well in the Nature Communications paper. But in brief, uh, there is a, the hippocampus, I don't know if you see, you know, the hippocampus bends dorsally uh, on the posterior end. And so when Scoville inserted his uh, sucking little sucking tubes, the vacuum tubes, those tubes were straight metal tubes. And they, of course, did not bend to remove the entire structure. So it was bit of the, it was strange that he did not realize that because actually in all other respects, the surgery was very precise. He wanted, he wanted it to be symmetrical and it was extremely symmetrical and, uh, and it was very minimally invasive in some respects because he was actually working from two small holes, uh, the size of a, the size of a, of a silver dollar, I guess, you know, mm. from, so it's, it's, and when actually, when I do autopsies and remove the brains, I take out the entire calvarium uh, and, I, and I lift the frontal lobes and I see the tips of the temporal lobes and I imagine what Scoville saw, but he had to see it from two small holes in the forehead. So it was a very difficult operation. So he was definitely good at it, but somehow he either he forgot or he did not uh, appreciate how much the hippocampus would curve in the brain. And so this was a big finding actually, because uh, again, you know, 50 years you're told everybody, even now there's many textbooks that say, uh, you know, HM is a hippocampal patient, that the hippocampus was removed and that's not true anymore. And so it may take time for this information to, to kind of trickle down and uh, into all the textbooks and into the classrooms. But it's, I think it's very important that it is. Yeah. So we got a question in actually. So thank you. Uh, 
thank you for the question um, and, and please uh, send more. So one question that we got here from one of our audience members asks about HM's emotions and were they limited in some way due to his memory issues, as far as you know? Uh, well, that's, it is not an easy question. <laughs> I don't know if I like this question. <laughs> no, uh, I think it may be easier for some other folks to answer. Um, remember, my expertise are in anatomy. Um, HM's emotions were, um, you know, the there's also a theme uh, that HM was very uh, placid, uh, was very, uh, uh, you know, HM lived in a very sheltered life uh, because obviously at the time there weren't any digital assistants, cell phones and things like that. So obviously somebody with such a profound impairment in memory was very limited. Um, moreover, he lived with the parents, with his mother, then he was under the care of uh, nurses in, in, various, uh, in various nursing homes. So, uh, but there are accounts of him, you know, showing strong emotions. And uh, I, I remember, well, even Dr. Corkin uh, told me that, you know, there were, there was, uh, his mother would be uh, the object of maybe some more anger. And there was another lady that he apparently detested in the nursing home, who was also the target of his, uh, of, I wouldn't say rage, I don't think that would be appropriate. Uh, but so he had this notion, but uh, we don't know whether he was depressed. Um, you know, there wasn't much done to test, you know, very psychiatric, psych psychiatric testing. Uh, and that's a very important aspect of this syndrome. Uh, again, now in, uh, in the face of the anatomy, uh, I think the whole point of this atlas is also to allow for these, um, these assumptions. Uh, now, one can go and look at different brain structure microscopically throughout the brain and look at different, you know, if you want to look at the nucleus accumbens, for example, and understand if HM had some disruptions in his uh, reward system. I mean, now I think the anatomy can speak more now than anecdotal results from various mm -hmm. interviews uh, that have been, you know, Dr. Corkin puts together very elegantly in her book, a lot of information that before was, uh, was sparse. Uh, and there was a new book by Luke Dietrich that also adds more information. But I think now we have the chance for anatomy to speak. And the anatomy, the, what I love about my work is that anatomy doesn't lie. You have it, uh, it's just us who interpret it wrong uh, and because we still don't know that, don't have the right knowledge. But if we go back to, you know, what we're doing with the nonprofit now with the Brain Observatory is to, you know, keep tight alive uh, and coincidentally I know this is not a fundraiser but I think the, you know we're keeping this side alive now mostly with private contributions so um, but imagine if somebody else will go back in in 20 years we want this to be up in 20 years uh, because in 20 years they might actually know more about the posterior hippocampus or other areas of the brain there is considerable white matter damage most of it was due to age but some of the white matter damage was also due to uh, to the lesion. So that would be very important in terms of what was this disconnection syndrome. Uh, the frontal lobe lesion, we would have to go back in the story page, but uh, uh, you know, there was, uh, we found that also there was the left frontal lobe was damaged during the surgery. Did that cause uh, some of the behaviors in HM that were recorded maybe just simply anecdotally. So I think the, the goal here is to revisit the anatomy and pathology of the brain and with what we know today, make a new uh, portrait of HM uh, and then that will be maybe updated when we know more about the brain itself. That's really terrific. So in keeping with our, our story um, and our timeline, so we've talked about the little bit of the story of HM, the cutting process. We talked about the original uh, grant as well. And what we're looking at here is essentially the first, uh, close to what was the first atlas that uh, you put up, I believe around 2013, is that right? Yeah. And then um, as you were transitioning um, organizationally, I think that's when we got in touch, right? I believe that there was a challenge uh, that you had at that point in terms of just um, uh, getting the site uh, back up again. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, because the the transition from the from UCSD to the independent uh, or non-profit, like you said, this organizational tr transition had its challenges because you know we had all our data at the UCSD Supercomputer Center, but it was also linked to our UCSD domain, um, and UCSD, uh, you know, when a, a, an invest a, a professor leaves the university you know, the website is not supported anymore. So the challenge was to extract this website, uh, the, the Atlas, and make it usable even outside of the UCSD domain. So that's when I, the first time I invoked uh, uh, Stephen uh, help, you know, because I had already gradually, you know, obviously closed the laboratory down by making sure people who worked in the lab had you know obviously a job and uh, you know give it enough time it occurred over a year and uh, so at that point i with the non-profit we 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 switched to a more of a contractor agreement rather than having uh, paid staff just for sake of making sure we didn't have too many commitments in terms of salaries you know as a new organization and that's when i met steven and we started talking about okay let's um let's now first of all make sure that there is continuity in hm because people are using it there was actually an interruptions of several months that couldn't be avoided because we work with ucsd and ucsd was actually very very helpful and collaborative in this respect to help us migrate the site but you know it's a bureaucracy and uh, so i remember that our account was uh, was closed before we could transition the site, so we had to look at our backups, and and that's where you know we started working together. Then we reshuffled all the components. I think not all of the components are here because they are redundant with the new site, but we we wanted to preserve that original atlas because it's a uh, well, I mean, I'm I'm a bit attached to it, uh, and also because. It was well. It's well organized, and it's a very simple. It's its self-contained environment with a nissle stain to look at site architecture. Uh, however, as you know, then we we had another grant from the National Science Foundation, which actually was awarded while at UCSD, and then we transferred. And uh, and that site and that grant, I apologize, was uh, was then the, the what we needed to say. Okay, we're going to do a 2.0. Uh, version because now we have more data that we'd like to make available I think let's try to open up as much as we can and also make it a little more elegant a little more updated in terms of tools uh, improve, improved usability of course uh, we can only know if it's improved uh, by getting feedback um, and so that will help too uh, you know don't be shy just write directly to me at the Brain Observatory with any issues, and then uh, uh, we can eventually, when we have the next updates, we can take those into consideration. You know, I've, I've been so engrossed in this project uh, that sometimes I see it one way, but, and I'd like to, I'd like to make it more of a teaching tool as well for, uh, for education in the classroom, whether it's a, a middle school or a, or a undergraduate degree but i think that would be the next step that i'd be very interested in doing using it as a to create curriculum for for classes so you can actually take things from everywhere and uh, and build your story from everything that's contained on this site that would be my next step yep so, so we as we looking at it yeah yeah i know so as we're so as we're going through our flow here and talking about the site which i think we're going to walk through next um I will say that uh, some of the comments about frontal lobe raised several questions that came up just now um, in the in the webinar. So thank you, folks, for asking those questions. Please keep them coming. I'll pick a representative one, and maybe Jacopo, you can either answer or you can tell people how to go find the answer for themselves uh, within the site. But the question is: So you identified frontal lobe pathology in, in HM's brain. Do you believe that much of the anomalous behavior of HM that cannot be explained as memory deficit can be attributed to frontal lobe pathology. Uh, Stephen, can you go to the story page? Do you mind? Yeah. Um, yes. No problem. Yep. And there's an article on that frontal lobe lesion. There you go. Is it the HM pathology one, plaques and tangles? Or the frontal lobe. That's the one. finding, yes. Okay, great. So in here, you, tell us what, what people will find. 
Well, here we put some images of, uh, you can click on it. I think there is a better image underneath if it opens up. All so the, right. the, the, the first thing that we needed to, uh, you know, we saw this, we saw this when uh, actually I, I first noticed in the MRI that was done post-mortem on the cadaver. And then we looked at it, we saw it actually in the, also when I was slicing, because now I had, I, I put a sort of a mental note to say, you know, go and look in the frontal lobe. And, and when I actually, when I was peeling the brain, again, I hope you're not having breakfast, but you know, <laughs> the, I put a, a small technical note here. So the brain obviously, after you know, it's surrounded by meninges and blood vessels. So before you, you do the preparation for the slicing, you you have to remove them when we'll go to the autopsy section we can show before and after like those uh, cookie commercials you know when you when you prepare the brain so i remember when i then peeled uh, with tweezers you know it takes about five six hours to do it without damaging the cord it's a very long you know you have to do a long careful job of, of cutting the blood vessels and um i i saw this guy this car but it was very um it was very cauterized. So it, it really did look like an old lesion because the first impression was, okay, did we do this when we removed the brain at autopsy? But when Dr. Frosch and I removed the brain, I remember that we were extremely careful. And if something like major like that would have happened, I think we would have all freaked out. Uh, instead, we didn't see anything like that because of course he was a bit hidden by the meninges at the time. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you see that in actually in the, that's what proved that this lesion was not made at autopsy because the images there that you see on your screen and you can find on the website, exactly. You know, this is a lesion, as you see, in, in the scan before the autopsy. So the lesion was already there. And we had also with our co-authors of that paper in Nature Communications, we had to, um, uh, my lab had to, no, I wouldn't say fight for it, but we, we thought it was a very important finding and we wanted to make sure that it was published uh, while there was also a sense like, you know, let's wait till we're really sure. Um, but I was very, you know, again, as an anatomist, I was convinced. And you can see the white matter lesion beneath the cortex. I'm going to get, and this is sort of the technical uh, aside. If you look at the atlas and you go into the site architecture, you also see that there is gliosis and, and there are other ways to determine that this is an older lesion. Um, and so we could, our, our hypothesis was that because Scoville lived, you can keep, you can go to the other images maybe, but before Scoville, as Scoville was literally lifting the frontal lobes and holding them up with a spatula, uh, one more mm -hmm. position procedure. Yep. Uh, you know, it's very likely. There you go. It's very likely that you know by keeping it lifted. Uh, he may have actually created a little scarring, whether he was aware of it or not. It's not, I don't think he was in his notes. And so for me, this is the thing that made more sense uh, because it was the orbitofrontal gyrus was right in the line of, uh, of fire, so to speak, you know, of the, yeah. of the tool. So now uh, there is an article that came out. Uh, so if you, sir, I, I don't have it handy, I'm afraid, but uh, there is a, an article that came out last year about the frontal lobe lesion and, and a chance behavior. So um, I cannot an answer this uh, completely, but, but there is a publication that came out uh, in a journal. So if you look at uh, HM frontal lobe behavior in Google Scholar, I'm sure you'll, um, I'm not an author, but it, it came out and it actually reads it. It's, it's actually, is trying to answer exactly this question. So I encourage you to, to look for that. And yeah, we maybe, can actually maybe post it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, that might be a good addition to the site. I can tell you right now, if you wanna start navigating the site. Oh yeah, let's, I, I think we should go ahead and do that. Um, let's see, there'll be, another, there'll be another good question to go into next. Um, I just wanted to say sort of in the flow of all this, so, really interesting stuff about this, uh, the frontal lobe. And I know that that's been a source of interesting intrigue. Um, that found, when, yeah, you, you got it. So the title is Behavioral Evidence 
suggestive of frontal lobe pathology in the amnesic HM. The author is uh, Winter, and it's on uh, brain and cognition. There you go. There you go. So I think there's a lot, a um, lot of. He he actually does a review on all these behavioral um, manifestations of HM that could be, you know, attributed to that frontal lobe lesion. But I must say the frontal lesion is very uh, localized. Yep. Uh, so in terms of side architectonic, uh, the question is, you know, whether it could have caused a disconnection syndrome. Uh, the, the white matter lesion underneath uh, combined with the site architectural damage. I mean, there is a big hole, so but we're talking about a centimeter or two. So mm -hmm. it just, it could be or it could not. But I think that's a good review uh, that I, that could answer those questions. I should, we should probably, I'll make a post, uh, I'll make a new blog entry on the story page with this. Yeah, that'd be great. Actually, I think that partially answers one other question that came in, which was, is there a database of HM's behaviors? And do scientists working on this atlas try to correlate those behaviors with structures they observe? Is that something that is possible on a dead brain? It sounds like this paper that you just mentioned, although I don't know that it made a first, formal database. This base. was the first uh, peer-reviewed paper that came out that did exactly that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that answers that very one. Very interesting. I think the like I'm, most of the requests we use to use the website are uh, are generally for teaching. So it looks like the biggest impact that this project has had is on uh, science education. And we have college level, uh, primarily, uh, and uh, high school level. Uh, and actually, uh, somebody just asked if there were any lesson plans or activities set up for middle school students that are available on the website. <laughs> well, that would be our next, as I said, that would be what I would love to do next, is to really have a, add layers to this website that can interact with the data and make it very easy for a teacher or even student themselves to, to build up either a PowerPoint presentation or a, a lecture or a poster. Um, and that's an exciting, so I was actually just, uh, I just visited the, I had a pilgrimage to the National Science Foundation the, uh, very recently uh, at the Division of Research on Learning. And because the Brain Observatory, we, we want to, in 2019, be, you know, be much more involved in uh, in learning, and not just memory and learning, but on the educational aspect. And I think, again, this this the way that we organize the data, Stephen. You know, uh, it's it lends itself to queries that are not just, you know, like like this now, sort of a scrolls. Uh, we wanted to avoid the folders hierarchy, which we did. So everything yep. is presented very well, very accessible. But the next layer, I think, will be to be able to ask a question and, and retrieve the information that you need to answer that question. Absolutely. Greater so, professor and academia and, or for science. But the science, uh, you know, scientists are, uh, are a bit stubborn. So they, uh, they take time to digest new evidence. Yes, we do, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think we can include ourselves in that. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Well, um, I think uh, we're getting a lot of great response, everybody. Thank you so much for the questions that are coming in here. Please keep them coming. Um, I wanted to just go back and make a note about the transition um, from UCSD to the Brain Observatory and when we first connected, Jacopo, how exciting it was for me to be able to get the chance to bring Metacell's skills to bear on this project, even when it was just in the early stages of, um, can we you know, stand the data back up? Can we um, give you some good operational support for making that data available on the public web? Um, this was really exciting. The data set uh, is something that I had known about all throughout grad school, and uh, we were really honored to get the chance to do that. Um, when we, as, as you were starting to uh, talk about, uh, the site that we're looking at right now, is an evolution on what we had uh, originally, what you had originally started with and what we had worked together to stand back up. And since we're 15 minutes out, I think it's time to start yeah, showing folks some of the tour. experience. Exactly, I'll let you drive and I will just, maybe as you go through, I, if there is anything that I think would be 
interesting to just point a little more attention to, but we'll be mindful that we have 15 minutes, so. Yeah, absolutely. But let me make a comment, though, uh, before we start uh, very quickly. So the way that the, eventually we settled on the organization of the data, um, it was we wanted to maintain the idea of a story. And so we, I don't know if you remember, we had this discussion. There were many ways this data could have been presented. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of going through different levels of resolution or going uh, 2D, 3D. So there were a lot of different ways that we could have presented it. So we decided to maintain the sense of what happened in the project itself from, you know, from when HM died, uh, what happened, and then the autopsy, and then the uh, almost revisiting what, what, what I experienced in a sense. Mm -hmm. So if we go from left to right on the side, you'll see that there is the MRIs, uh, and the first one is an MRI that was done the night that HM died. This was done at the MGH in Boston. And uh, it was, these were the first scans uh, made post-mortem, which are very valuable because of course, they are scans in situ. They are scans that are, made, the brain is now the way it was in HM's head. So in terms of volumetric analysis uh, and uh, looking at the, um, the geometry of the brain, the level of atrophy at the gross level, these are very useful. And it allowed us also to prove that that frontal lobe lesion was actually there before. Um, and this is a protocol that we use in the brain library as well. Uh, the cadaveric scans are very important because if we're going to compare histology to MRI, you know, three months could make a difference in somebody's brain. So really uh, having a 3D MRI view of the brain immediately before the brain is extracted, it's very important. Uh, then we added to this side also the, the scans that we did on the brain itself at UCSD after I brought the brain back to San Diego. And those are higher resolution in a sense. And it was important to have because those are the scans of the fixed brain. Now the brain has been fixed in, uh, you can probably find a, if you, let's get an image of the, of the, scans in situ, but oh no, maybe let's go to the autopsy first, just, uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as I said, eventually we did the autopsy and if you, you see, these are images of the brain after it was peeled and clean, you can open any of this. Let's see, mm -hmm. you see, so this is a clean brain. Uh, now, if you go back and show them what the brain looks like, uh, uh, before peeling. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's uh, not so clean. Formaldehyde fixed tissue also, you can show. Uh, and then... Yeah, uh, this was actually the day of the autopsy. Yeah, you see, if you open this, now this is the brain after it's been fixed in formalin, and you can see all the blood vessels, and also it looks like you can see the gyri, but in reality there is the pia mat, the pia, uh, the meninges are there, so you need to peel them off. You peel them off because when you're slicing, otherwise the blood vessels, they they get dragged on the blade and they ruin the tissue. So it's just, it's really a necessity to be able to get good histological images in the cortex. Uh, and uh, anyway, so this was, you know, in terms how you prepare the brain eventually for, for the cutting. Uh, the MRI is ex situ, which means not inside the head, the cranium. Those, as I mentioned before, were done to get a 3D model of the brain the way that it fixed. Now, one little known fact, unless you are a pathologist, uh, is that you know when you fix the brain, unless you do a perfusion, uh, pretty much like embalming sort of thing, you, you suspend it upside down in a bucket with formalin and you, you tie it with a string to the basilar artery. So there are some distortions that happen naturally uh, mm -hmm. Not so much shrinking because in formalin the shrinkage is not very significant, but still there are geometrical changes. So these scans that we did, in addition to providing a higher resolution, because you know the dead brain you can keep it in there, it's fixed, you can keep it in there the whole night as we do, eight hour scans. And then it would give us a better idea in 3D of the of the anatomy. Bear in mind, you know, we were not 100% sure that the slicing would go as planned. So this was also insurance. Like, okay, if this, we cannot get through the whole brain, if something happens, 
uh, then at least we have this. So then came the real, the, 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 the best part, I think, which is the slicing and the, and the generation of the so-called block face images. Um, we had a camera, a digital camera on top of the, of the brain. So every time that the, the blade would slice a, a section, we would take a picture. So we ended up with 2,401 slices and 241 images of the slice before it was sliced. And so we were, I think there was probably, you know, we were, I don't want to say lucky because we, we prepared very well, but we, it went, it went as planned. It went even, you know, it couldn't have gone better. Uh, so we did get all the images throughout the brain and we have a sample one in 10, I think we chose here. I don't remember if it's one in 10, just for sake of uh, not loading this website too much. Uh, That's right. And this is very important because remember, they are still aligned because we take the image in alignment with the block and the microtome stage. And then we did further alignment post-production. But uh, and so we were able to generate a 3D model and that's what we published in Nature Communications in 2014. But at this point, if you look at a section, um, you know, for example, with the, with the hippocampus a little further, further down, I mean, you already can detect the anatomy very well. And uh, yeah, like one of those slices, for example. I think it's very interesting to see how clear the anatomy is in these images. Even though the brain was frozen, of course, some of the contrast was, was removed. And uh, the beauty about this process is that each of these images are connected to a brain slice, a physical slice of the brain that was originally cut at 70 microns. And then we could stain the slice and, and that's what we've put in the histological atlas. We have also a section on virtual slices um, yep. that you may want to, we don't have a lot of time, but you may want to tell them what, we're not using Google here anymore. Uh, you may want to tell our listener what you used here to enable ah. zooming in. Ah, well, um, it, uh, it was the amazing engineering staff at Metacell that came up with an alternative uh, viewer for this. Uh, I believe we reused open source technologies for this as we uh, as we commonly do. We did a pretty comprehensive analysis of a lot of different options uh, for this and we ended up going with, um, yes, uh, in, in an open source product whose name eludes me uh, at the moment, but the experience I think is really much smoother than what we were getting with uh, the Google API. Um, I will tell you since uh, I myself did get involved in producing the uh, images for this in terms of running, uh, essentially this is a pyramidal stack. So in order to have such a smooth experience like this, you need to uh, generate uh, thousands and thousands of images. Um, they pose quite a challenge also for copying because it's so many images that a, a file system starts to choke. Uh, we had a fun experience trying to move this around in an initial test on Dropbox, which was a miserable failure. Um, until we got a little bit smarter about that and realized that um, we needed to get a bit more high performance thing than just that. Um, this was all some of the internal internal stuff that uh, that I was looking over. But but our engineers found the right tool for this in the end. Um, and uh, I think the experience really speaks for itself here in terms of how clear this is and um, how easy it is to navigate. Um, if you're watching online, uh, depending on your connection, it's probably not as smooth as it'll be uh, when you're hitting the site directly, but I do recommend that you check it out. Um, there's several different alternative slices in here, all of which are loaded using the same viewer. And I, it's very interesting, it's actually, if you, if you go towards the right of the slice. Yes. Uh, that's, this was another interesting finding that we put out there for people um, you know, to answer the question before. You know, it, we, this is a, a stain called the Campbell Switzer stain. And Bob Switzer is the CEO of uh, Neuroscience Associates. They do histological services. And uh, it's my good friend. Uh, and Bob, you know, this stain is, is very elegant because it selects the um, Alzheimer plaques 
um, but it yeah. does it very selective and very high contrast. And so what we, we tried it on, on this slice, a few slices of HM, and it's very interesting, we only had the lesions on the, on the left uh, temporal lobe. So if you zoom a little more, you see mm -hmm. that in the remaining hippocampus, and uh, okay, now you can go down a little bit. Yeah, so you see that the left temporal lobe uh, is actually full of this uh, of these plaques, but not the hippocampus. So, you know, again, this is something. This may have happened later in life in HM, but it's very interesting that you see you you in when you do these microscopy studies and you do histology, you see, you know, you create essentially. It's almost like developing a photograph, and mm. if now you see facts, you see figures, you see. Um, it, it, the brain speaks to you, uh, but you need to know, you know, how to put the question. So you need to know what what to target, and then you you reveal these patterns that uh, are connected to behavior. And so the, the the original idea was to create an open source brain. I remember my first interview. I was so nervous with I think it was Joe Palka, NPR, when when we first uh, really started working and. And he said, you know, what is your concern? I said, well, we want to do an open source brain so that uh, I don't have all the expertise. In fact, I have very little expertise in uh, in memory at, at, in terms of the cognitive. Um, I'm not a memory researcher. I'm an anatomist. I'm a, uh, maybe a new informatician. I'm, I'm a cognitive scientist, but I look at the brain structure. And so the idea was if we, have, if we could have this brain as open source, then anybody can ask, the questions that they they want, and anybody can apply their insight and expertise to data that it's as we said before doesn't lie that it's there. I mean, I did not make this up with Photoshop. You know, painting yeah. all the lesions. Uh, this is it, and it will always be like this. And so yeah. maybe one day there'll be another article, uh, a paper that talks about this accumulation of lesions in the in the left temporal lobe, not the right, and and maybe connected with some behaviors in HM because it's very important to understand. Uh, I mean, HM is, uh, I mean, the idea here is to connect anatomy to behavior in general, not just memory. Uh, HM was a proof of concept to say, can we do that? How do we best do that to enable the cognitive scientist to approach anatomy in a functional way? and uh, kind of work together. So that's why we didn't do what was done for Einstein or what is done for most brain banks, which is to take the brain and cut it into little pieces. We could have never seen, uh, we could have never watched a scene like this if we had just sampled the brain of HM in little blocks, like it's normally done in pathology. So Jacopo, we're uh, out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted to uh, show folks the, uh, 3D model of the brain, which I believe you've got a physical version of right there next to you. Is that, uh, oh. do I see that correctly? Yep. Very nice. So <laughs> you can observe that here as well as other um, brain regions uh, within this section. And I wondered if you could, just before we wrap up, um, uh, let folks know what's next, um, what uh, additional help uh, you might need um, in this process as you go forward, any additional uh, funding. That you might be looking for well at the moment i think we we're trying to maintain this website uh, with uh, with the budget of the nonprofit. so primarily it's private contribution we're going we're writing grants of course uh, but remember this is now a project that it's completed in the sense that uh, we we think we're gonna we're gonna focus on the educational component um, the in terms of the brain library again we have uh, we have over 100 brains that uh, some are 100 brains actually that we have not yet even sliced but we have other brains that have been sliced and digitized so i think the next effort is going to be to use this infrastructure that we built to to start uploading other cases uh, you know for example even brains that show normal anatomy uh, and other patients. We're also very active with uh, we're also very active with the brain bank to work with other famous patients who uh, famous in the in the medical literature 
I apologize, there is a phone going now. Maybe that's our alarm to say time is up. Yeah. So the idea is to build this library with extraordinary cases and ordinary folks uh, and, and kind of grow it. So because they really, I think the question out there is what's the variability? HM is a special case, um, but in, what I'm interested in scientifically is what's the variability uh, among people in terms of brain anatomy. And now that you experience the site, you know that once you zoom in and look at single cells, then variability, uh, to, you know, assume it's a big challenge to study it, you know, counting neurons, counting neurons in the brain of an artist in the visual cortex versus uh, which area of the visual cortex, the area V4, can we trust the functional subdivision and call it area V4? Do artists have an area V4 that has more packed cells? And if so, which layer? Layer three, layer four, layer two. So imagine all these questions. But the fascinating aspect is the brains are there, they contain all this data, and it's up to us to, to publish it, to, to sort of bring it out in the open and give a voice to these brains. Uh, in a, in a, that's what I like about neuroinformatics, uh, is that you really give a voice to, you can go from a, a specimen in, the, in a bucket and create something like this that now it can inform thousands of people i mean we get requests from all over the world uh right. so anyway uh, it's kind of transcending into the philosophy of uh, of neuroinformatics uh, data sharing open science citizen science these are all fascinating aspects if you go to the brain observatory website naturally you can read what we stand for in terms of uh, as an organization the way we view science uh, and just sign up to our to our newsletter. I mean, become part of this, and give us feedback because, you know, Stephen and I are not like uh, the typical academic. We actually listen. We don't necessarily <laughs> think that we know best all the time. <laughs> Very okay. good. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to cut it off here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending the time on this. Um, we re really enjoyed this project. We really enjoyed this webinar. I think it was uh, a really great time. We got lots of great uh, feedback from folks and, and questions. So thank you for joining us. Uh, please stay tuned. We will be doing more of these webinars coming up. Um, and do please go to the Brain Observatory, check out check out the site, um, give feedback to Jacopo, and uh, get in touch and connect. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you.